everyone, and we're onward, onward to the Brayton cycle right here. Now, the Brayton cycle is the one that's honestly more important to you probably than anything else. Okay, you probably love your car, so the auto cycle is pretty awesome. If you drive a truck, maybe the diesel cycle is important to you. Regeneration just sounds cool, but the Brayton cycle is the reason that you're able to turn on your fridge. I'm very happy that my fridge is currently on. I can look over there. Yeah, I'm sitting in my living room right now, and I can see my fridge is currently lit. Thank goodness. Our other fridge, it was kind of wonky. But what am I talking about here? The Brayton cycle is the ideal cycle for gas turbine engines, and the thing that's producing most of the power for your home are gas turbines. It can also be coal-powered turbines. In that case, it's honestly very, very similar because we don't really care what's being combusted, just we know that something is being combusted. And in fact, since we are going to idealize this, we're just going to forget at all about this being a combustion chamber, and we're just going to say, hey, that's a constant pressure heat addition process, and hey, that, const that exhaust process where we exhaust gases right here, that's just a constant pressure heat rejection process. Okay, so let's look at this turbine power cycle and see what's going on. So first off, we have fresh air. It goes into the compressor. Now, when we're idealizing it, the air never leaves, wink, wink, but in this one, it does. So we have fresh air going in the compressor. It gets compressed to high temperature. That's isentropic compression. That then goes into my combustion chamber where we have constant pressure heat addition. We're just adding heat very very quickly how is it happening that's happening through combustion then we have isentropic expansion and that's where the work is being produced as a note you see that says work net that's because it takes work to make the compressor run and so i what i have right here is work out from the turbine which is more minus work in that is what the work net is equal to and finally, I have the exhaust gases which are leaving, but we're pretending that those don't actually leave and it's just constant pressure heat rejection. Now, why can it be constant pressure heat rejection? Well, because the pressure there is just ambient. It doesn't change, and so it's able to go out as it pleases. So this is the Brayton cycle. Now, if you look at this, we have some things that aren't that bad. Constant pressure, constant pressure, isentropic, isentropic. We've dealt with all these before. So the overall process is pretty similar to what we've seen in the past. And here is after I've idealized it. We've gone from having some, you know, real things, combustion chamber, to not so real things, heat exchangers. But we have to idealize to allow ourselves to solve these problems. If we don't idealize it, we can't actually deal with them. Other things. As a note, these have very long derivations. I don't want to do that. And so instead of getting those derivations, which are in your textbook, you can check them out. I just go ahead and give them to you. This is what's called the pressure ratio, P1 to P2. How much is our compressor compressing it? And you can see that the thermal efficiency of the brain cycle is a function of my compression ratio, okay? It's a function of my compression ratio. The higher that compression ratio, the higher my efficiency, okay? The higher my efficiency. I want to make it as big as possible so that this value right here can be as small as possible. So if I had a compression ratio of infinity, I would then have this one minus zero. It'd be perfectly efficient. Sadly, we cannot compress things to infinity. Just remember that the better our compressor is, the better our um, efficiency for these turbines. Okay. Now, here is an example of a Braden cycle running through it. We have right here our TS diagram and our PV diagram. I love these GIFs. They're absolutely fantastic. So what you can see is we have our two isentropic processes right here. This is isentropic expansion. Make sure I'm doing this right. Yes. And we have isentropic compression. Make sure I did this right. Yes, I did. That's good. It's two to three, two to three. I'm a doofus. I did it wrong. So one to two is our isentropic expansion right here and right there. There we go. And then we have isentropic compression as well, right here. Sorry, got my diagrams mixed up. That happens. So then we have our constant pressure process right there. And we have it all looking good. So what you can see through this is this is our compressor. This is our turbine. The turbine turns the compressor, okay? So your turbine is always what's providing the power in to keep your compressor running and keep the cycle going. And so we have heat being added in the heat exchanger, which is after our combustion chamber. That's these little waves coming in. And we have heat leaving through the um, heat exchanger. 
So overall, this is what's going on here. This is what's happening inside of our gas turbine. And this process is happening continually, thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of times every single day to keep your house running. So you need to understand how this works and how we can make this as efficient as possible. So like I showed you earlier, our thermal efficiency increases with pressure ratio. So the higher we can go, the better it is. And we usually have ratios somewhere between 5 and 20. You're like, why not infinity? Well, at some point, we just simply can't compress it that far without having it being exorbitantly expensive. Now, ah, another thing we can see is what the net work of our brain cycle is. So this is for different values of my compression ratio, okay? And what you might notice is that if I'm looking at how this works, I actually did my diagrams correctly. These are all drawn to scale, so I know they're correct. T max and T min, this is for fixed values. So if I have a particular max temperature, a particular min temperature, there is actually an ideal um, compression ratio when it comes to the amount of work I can output. So instead of having a max at 15, which is my highest, most, of, well, most efficient on this diagram, I actually have much more work coming out of it when I have a more middling term, more middling term for the overall compression ratio. Now, why is this? It's based on how the cycle is shaped. This is our TS diagram. Remember, our network is the area inside this TS diagram. And if we have these fixed temperatures, then I have to only certain shapes I can take. Only certain shapes I can take. So from here to here, that difference is all from the compression ratio. It jumps 15 times, it jumps eight times, it jumps two times, okay? Very, very small differences there. And after you see that, that I have either a couple of things that can happen. I have my heat addition process right here, right here, and right here. Very, very long heat addition process. And if I was able to go to much higher temperatures, well, this would work out great, but I can't. There's only certain temperatures that my system can actually handle. And so what this is getting at is you have a whole host of factors you have to think about when you're dealing with these cycles. You can't just look at max efficiency because max efficiency is great, but if your system can't take the settings it would take to get max efficiency, you're not going to be able to do that. You're going to waste your time because you're going to be producing a lot less work than you could have if you took a less efficient but more um, power producing cycle for your settings, for your um, turbine. So something to think about as we go forward. Okay, we're going to stop there for now.